Kia ora koutou. Welcome um, everyone and thank you for joining us um, for Brain Date Health Tech. Um, my name is Mary Golter and I'm the Relations and Events Assistant for the College of Engineering. Um, just some quick health and safety before we get started. Um, if, if there is an emergency, um, pretty much just follow staff instruction. There's a, um, there's a meeting point um, just outside of the building, so if you just um, out the doors and hang right um, on the grass area is where we would meet. Um, if you need to go to the bathroom at all, um, there's a bathroom just across the way. Um, there, I've got some assistants outside that will point you in the right direction if you do need to go. Um, I'm really excited for the uh, for the presentations that we've got tonight. Um, each of our uh, presenters have got 10 minutes to talk um, about what's going on in their, their world in terms of health tech. Um, and you'll have five minutes after the presentation for any burning questions. Um, if that isn't enough, there is um, there will be drinks and nibbles afterwards um, to ask any more questions. And if that still isn't enough, um, inside your wee booklet here, you've got their contact details, their email and their LinkedIn, so you can always continue the conversation um, that way. Um, cool, so that's enough from me. Um, to start us off, we've got uh, Dr Debbie Munro from Mechanical Engineering. Um, so she'll be talking to us on creating a culture of translational research in health tech. Um, research is one of the cornerstones of academia, um, but only a tiny fraction of it ever moves out of the lab and becomes a usable device. There are many barriers to creating a culture of transla translational research, and Debbie is going to talk to us about ideas for moving past these um, to help New Zealand reach new levels of innovation and entrepreneurship. All right. Thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm a senior lecturer here in mechanical and biomedical engineering. So the, the health tech industry, although um, a lot of small companies in New Zealand, is quite robust and growing all the time. It's um, the origins of kind of the current culture in New Zealand dates back to Sir Paul Callahan, and he gave a, a important talk back in 2011 about strategy New Zealand and how to map our future and talked a lot about uh, innovation and doing economically complex products. So what we need to improve our economy and to be strong in the future is high-tech exports in niche areas where we can actually compete on the global frontier. Because right now, um, a lot of our products in New Zealand are commodities. We do a lot of food and agriculture, and they have very small profit margins. They're also difficult to export because they can perish or they, um, they're big and heavy and expensive to transport. So the solution, in my opinion, is, is health tech, okay? because we can make great things that are small and can be shipped all over the world and we have the um, the people and the resources here to make a difference in the world. It's also a great opportunity for our youth. It's one of the top five most in-demand in jobs right now and is considered the top growth field for the future. It's also one of the national objectives for New Zealand to grow the health research sector of our economy. So how do we participate in that? And I think we need to start developing these entrepreneurs and researchers to achieve these goals because they're going to come through our universities. So this is where they're going to get that kind of training. So what is translational research? Um, shown here, this is Keith Alexander, he's actually the person being assisted, but um, he developed the spring-free trampoline, among many other um, inventions, has won Innovator Awards all the time. So he's my role model of a translational researcher. This is a, a patient um, lifting device that 
can assist a caregiver to move a mostly immobile patient from one location to another without hurting themselves in the process. So translational research is aimed at solving specific problems. It converts research into practice. And it's kind of the opposite of the way most research is done in academia, where you start with the problem and then you conduct research towards that problem. So you, you don't know what approach is going to work. You don't know what solution you're going to have. And then you keep driving towards it until you find a way to solve the problem. Whereas more traditional research is done for the love of science and you're exploring new things, new materials, new ways of um, solving problems. And then when you get to the end and you have a breakthrough and you've discovered something, you go looking for an application for it, which usually isn't as effective because it's there's no ready-made market for your breakthrough from the beginning. So this is my research. Um, I participated recently in the Health Tech Supernode Challenge and was lucky enough to win at that event. And what I was talking about is some translational research that I've developed around um, diagnosing spinal fusion. So spinal fusion is done um, to eliminate pain in the spinal column. And the, um, the spine, it, it, are, the vertebrae articulate with each other. And so in between them there is a joint shown in that red circle called the facet joint. And there's a pad of cartilage on there that wears away, creating bone-on-bone -bone contact and significant pain. So if you, if you fuse those two vertebrae together, then you eliminate that motion and you eliminate the pain. So you put in four pedicle screws, you fasten a rod between them, and then you add a, a bone growth factor that creates the fusion itself. So why spinal fusion? And the problem was brought to me by an orthopedic surgeon. They were trying to basically read the tea leaves and find out when the spine was fused by looking at x-rays. But you can't tell if something's fused until after the bone has mineralized and, and been infused with calcium and other minerals. Because um, x-rays can only see solid objects. They can't see soft tissue, which is what the fusion is until it's finally um, infused with calcium. So if you're looking at x-rays, you're going to be waiting four months or longer, whereas um, it's actually fused at about eight weeks. And the surgeons need some way of measuring this so that they can get their patients back to normal activities and to their jobs rather than being at home. So this is what it looks like at eight weeks. It is fused and structurally um, strong enough at this point for the person to resume normal activities. But the surgeons wait until 16 weeks when the fusion looks like this on an x-ray. And so my device is a, a sensor that can measure the stiffness of that construct and tell you when it's si stiff enough and therefore fused. So we wanted a faster, more accurate method of assessment. And that's where my device comes in. It's a, uh, a sensor that captures the early healing. It's wireless, battery free. It works with your existing um, surgical techniques. And it's based on stiffness. And this is all uh, inside the body, but then outside you have this non-invasive reader that puts the information not only into the hands of the surgeon, but into the hands of the patient themselves, which I think will help with compliance. Um, if you know that you're, it's improving, even though you can't see anything or feel anything different, you're more likely to stay uh, on rest until it's fully fused. And I think that we can detect it in as little as 8 to 12 weeks. So here's some other examples of translational research that have been done here in uh, College of Engineering. So we have a um, glucose monitoring device on the left with one of our postdocs. 
Jennifer, and then on the right, that's Banjo. He's a penguin with a prosthetic foot. Okay, so this is the um, this was the problem we were trying to solve. We made him a little foot that looks exactly like a penguin foot. He didn't like it. Um, what the customer really wanted was um, something that made it easier for him to walk, and so we replaced it with something that looked very much like a, a little sponge tennis ball, and he loved it. Okay, so you gotta have the voice of the customer in your products. Um, we've made a bunch of um, adult um, glycemic control devices where People have better ways of monitoring their blood sugar levels, but some of the uh, glucose monitoring devices that are out there are quite costly, and they also depend on batteries and other technologies that limit their lifespan. So they're only suitable for an economy like New Zealand. They can't be taken into developing worlds, and so that's where the problems really exist, uh, uncontrolled diabetes. So there's some great stuff out there. So we need to foster a new culture. Um, we need to develop programs such as um, the minor in biomedical engineering that I established here in mechanical engineering. We're expanding that over into mechatronics engineering. And one of my students there on the right, Grace, is in Uganda on a nine-week summer uh, work experience to understand about um, innovation on the fly. And we need to create opportunities for students to get involved in um, health tech as soon as possible, not waiting until their final years of study. So we've uh, established a club, a UC Biomed club. We have overseas summer work experiences. Uh, we went to Tonga in 2018-19. We went to, I mean, Uganda in 2018-19 and Tonga 2019-20. We didn't go last year for obvious reasons. Um, but we also need to develop internships, summer research experiences, final year projects, and funded postgrad positions to get students involved with this tangible uh, research. And these kinds of events I'm happy to participate in because we need to be more vocal and public about what's happening here at the university and forge your ties with the greater community about what we're doing so that um, they can see us as a resource and we can work together to maybe commercialize some of these ideas. And also, get the word out to these future students. I had a student last um, run a National Biomechanics Day last week. And so we had high school students, mostly girls, come in and um, do some hands-on biomechanics activities and learn about how you collect data off of the body. And um, in a couple of years, up to five years from now, they're going to be our future UC students. So that's where you have to get that word out. And uh, this is a fun place to be, and this is a fun subject to study. Um, we have a couple of biomechanics labs. This is the one over um, by the rec center where you can do all kinds of motion capture studies. And on the right, these are three of my students in Tonga, where we were assembling um, hospital beds to distribute to the various um, hospitals and clinics. And here on the left, I have um, Phoebe McRae from the Rose Center. She works with Maggie Lee over here. And um, I teach a biomedical design class to the third year mechanical engineering students, where we have a real-world problem to solve. And so Phoebe was explaining her needs for what this device needed to do, and the students worked in teams to come up with solutions. Um, this is Nina, who did the National Biomechanics Day, and um, her research is on sport climbing and how to improve performance of elite um, climbing athletes. These are some of the scenes from National Biomechanics Day, where they were playing and having some fun. So, translating research, I put out all the positive things, but it's really hard work. Um, the scarcity of funding is um, quite a problem. 
There's a lot of funding for things like Marsden, and they always want those blue sky, stretchy ideas that um, have a high probability of failure. And they don't want things that are mostly worked out and you're just trying to get it to be a really good device to send out the door. Um, so you have to look at other avenues. There's also a huge lack of incentives for faculty to invest time in translational research because um, it doesn't result in publications and we're, we need to do publications. Okay, that's um, kind of the way it is. And the, um, the funding models that we have in place are not conducive to commercialization. I might, um, if I come up with an idea here and I want to commercialize it, at best I will have like a one-third equity stake at the outset. And as soon as I get funding, that's going to dilute further. So by the end, I might have a 5% share. And um, where's the incentive or motivation to put the amount of time and effort required into something that you're not really going to benefit from? Um, another problem with the low equity share is that you lose control. So you don't have voting rights anymore. You don't have control of your own IP. So the board of directors of your spin-out company can end up, um, I don't know, voting you off the island, so to speak. So these are problems that are real that we need to consider. It also requires a skill set that's um, not really developed in us technical types. Okay, I've, I've learned a lot over the past year about all the things I didn't know. I've come to respect and value business and commerce people a lot um, because there's um, a, it's entirely different from research. And it takes time away from our other important tasks like teaching and supervising our students, etc. So we have to um, figure out a way to create time in order to be able to do these types of activities. But we're time poor. Okay, We have very little time, so how can we support our academics to do this? And um, I've got some ideas around that in terms of maybe we can fund our, our post-grads. They need jobs to support themselves, so maybe we can um, get them involved to offload some of the tasks and the work involved. And we also need training. So there are there are programs available, but they're not well advertised, especially not over here in engineering, of how to be an entrepreneur and how to do some of these things that we need to learn how to do in order to be successful as entrepreneurs. But there are opportunities. Um, we have the UC Center for Entrepreneurship. They're awesome. They run um, challenges and other things. There's a Think Lab, which is kind of a um, support service to learn how to commercialize or launch a small spin-out company. There's KiwiNet that um, has Tier 1 and Tier 2 funding to help you learn how to do um, commercialization of technology on a, a pretty reasonable budget. You can get up to $250,000 through KiwiNet, which will take you a long way. Uh, Callahan Innovation has multiple ways that can help. You can um, hire students for summer research experiences as well as postgrads, and they offer scholarships. They have this uh, Deep Tech Incubator Fund, which is what I'm working with now. Um, and they just have a whole bunch of advice and people that can help you be successful. There are the health tech challenges, like the one that I participated in, and um, that gives you good publicity and helps with connections. And there's a small amount of prize money, too, so there's no complaining about that. Um, we have the Canterbury Medical Research Foundation. They have seed grants and other things that can help. We used to have MedTech Corp. But that's in the process of becoming something new, a phoenix arising from the ashes uh, with new funding schemes now that they're no longer a core.
um, the Health Research Council funds um, research, but they really like research with medical doctors and scientists on the biological side involved. And as engineers, we're a little bit discriminated against, um, so it's good to have collaborations. And so that's where the networking and things like this come into effect. There's uh, SIFTI, Science for Technological Innovation, and strategic research grants that are available that can all provide pools of money and get you down the track a little bit farther. And probably most importantly, we have research and innovation here at UC. This is uh, the commercial team here, and they have been an enormous support to me. They, um, they can help arrange and facilitate connections with various individuals and help you um, make the connections that you need. So um, I've been working with Bridge West, which is one of the four New Zealand deep tech incubators. Um, Bridge West Ventures is the one I'm working with. There's also WNT, Brandon Capital, and Sprout, and they each have their area of specialization. Sprout, as you might suspect, is more agri-tech. Got to go? All right, wrapping it up. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, normally caused by, you know, falling over, car crashes. Um, it's quite prevalent in young males as they are kind of seen as, you know, to engage in the risks of taking behaviour that then results in a spinal cord injury. And there's no cure. You're essentially treated as if you've got a spinal cord injury unless it's proven otherwise. They're trying to minimise the damage at this point. Um, and part of the issue is why your nerves don't regenerate. They actually kind of do. But like every other... Um, injury you get, your body forms a scar. And when you break your spinal cord, that's actually breaking the barrier between your central nervous system and the rest of your body. Your body goes, well, we can't deal with this. And instead of actually trying to heal itself, it just tries to minimise the damage. And so it makes this very densely um, formed scar, which the neurons just can't get through. So they may try, but this scar is so dense to try and block off um, the peripheral and central nervous system again, that there's just no hope for any neurons trying to make any progress. So what can we do about this? What I've been looking into um, are these cells called Ophthorin sheathing cells. And just to give you a bit of a background on what they are and where they live, they live in the lining of your nose and in the brain. So the one in the nose is called the mucosa and it's the Ophthorin bulb in the brain. And their whole purpose in life is when you lose your sense of smell, like in the common cold or currently with COVID, um, these nerves actually sever. And the whole purpose of um, OECs, because life's too short to say Ophthorin sheathing cells every time, uh, is they guide and protect these neurons. And so they show these neurons where they need to go to reconnect with their targets. They protect them, so they're kind of like the rubber coating on a um, wire for electrical circuits. And they get your, cell, get your nerves back to where they're meant to be, and that's where you regain your sense of smell. So we had this great idea, what if we put these in the back? That'll be fun. Um, so it's like kind of a proof of principle, but this is, this is little Jasper at the beginning of the trial. He can't, can't walk, but after six months of getting his own cells, you can see he's actually starting to make some progress. And by the end of the trial, it's not perfect, but compared to with the um, beginning, he's doing an excellent job. So it's an excellent proof of principle of what these cells have the power to do. And who doesn't love a cute puppy? Yeah. <laughs> wouldn't be engineering or science if it didn't come with challenges. When we put these cells in the back, they don't want to live there. We've, especially if you've got a car crash, there's a lot of damage going on in there. And this is quite a toxic environment to be putting the cells into, and so they just go, I'd rather not. They're difficult to isolate. Like any cells in the body, they don't hang out on their own. You can't just pick them up and be like, oh, these are the cells I want. They're hanging out with all sorts of other cell friends, and there's no particular marker that we can use to, oh, it's positive that it's got to be the cell, because that will make life easier. Um, the cells tend to be better in terms of more pure and more active if you take them from the bulb. That is brain surgery. Surprisingly, not many people really want to go down that path. Um, and I have it on good authority from the surgeon we worked with that you have to make a hole about that big in the skull. Um, so, yeah. Mucosa cells, more potential contaminants, but... It's a five minute procedure, local anaesthetic, bleeding nose, a lot easier. Once you finally get your cells, they also don't last long in the lab. And as I said, because there's not this one marker that you can pick out and be like, oh, because it's positive for this, it must be right. People can't agree on what they are, how to characterize them or anything like that, because yay, science. So what we did in my lab in London is we made our own cell lines so we could actually grow them in the lab. So how we did that is we went through a purification process. Um, initially, our cells take a long time to attach. So we put them on plastic, like cell culture plastic, for 24 hours. Our cells didn't attach. Other cells, the contaminants tended to, in terms of like we characterized them. We then um, removed our cells that were in the um, cell culture liquid and plated them and expanded them. After this, we infected them with a virus <laughs> to genetically modify them. So what this did is it um, put a gene that we could um, switch on and off into the cells. By the addition of our drug, 4-OHT, which is also known as tamoxifen, we could turn the drug on. This would then, or we'll turn the gene on, and this would then drive cell cycle. So we could um, push the proliferation of cells in um, the lab. If we were then hoping to eventually put this into a patient, we can then remove tamoxifen and they shouldn't be able to cause cancer in um, people, ideally. Um, this has been used by uh, other companies who are making some excellent progress. I think they're in third phase clinical trials um, to use the same technology for uh, stroke and 
London, I think they are. No, they're in Wales now. Brexit caused them to move. Um, we then did a selection stage. We wanted to make sure our cells had picked up um, the genetic modifier, and then we cultured them. And finally, we had to characterise them because we wanted to know exactly what we were dealing with. We, as I said, they're even with um, us doing this genetic modification, they're still quite picky cells. We did this to seven cell lines, six from the mucosa, one from the bulb. Out of all of those, only two actually replicated properly in the lab, and once we karyotyped them, only one had a stable karyotype. So even with this technology, it's still not obviously <laughs> great. Um, so just to give a brief idea of what we've been looking at, more pretty pictures. Um, Again, kind of like a proof of concept that when we co-cultured our own OECs from the cell line and we um, cultured them together with neurons, we can see greater neuro outgrowth from our neurons compared to neurons on their own. This is important because um, there has been work that has shown that when you get this um, more, like more neuride extension and more neurites coming out, that has been shown to be um, indicative of whether you're going to get functional recovery later on. So this is why this is what we focused on. We've also done a lot of work in 3D because though 2D is great, body is 3D. If you can't make it work in 3D, you're not going to be able to get this into the body. So just a bit about what I'm hoping to do at UC. I said I've only been here since February. I want to continue the spinal cord work. I think it's really exciting and I think it's also just so nice because you can kind of see the impact you can potentially have on people. Um, and it's just, I just think it's incredible. I've also got a slight obsession with um, things like Alzheimer's disease and neurodegenerative disorders. I think part of this came up because we were learning about mad cow disease when I was an, a student, and I lived in the UK in that time, and I got paranoid and went home and did all the research on it. <laughs> um, my parents assure me that we pretty much didn't eat beef, so I should be fine. Um, but again, these cells can have the ability to um, myelinate and protect the neurons, and this myelination is, um, like the sheaths, it's said that um, protective coating around the wires, if you think of that as like the neurons in your brain, that's what gets damaged in a lot of these diseases. So if we can use these cells to help protect and repair that, that could be quite exciting work to do. As I said, um, doing a bit more work with uh, 3D models here as well. So I've previously done work in gels and microfluidics and I want to look at that because also the beauty of mic microfluidics is the fact that a lot of time with these cells you don't have much sample and you want to be able to utilise it as much as possible and so microfluidics gives you that opportunity to do high throughput screening to try and understand as much as you possibly can about this one population. And then I've also kind of sidestepped and looked, starting to look at um, gels and drug delivery and um, how we can get targeted um, drugs to certain parts of the body and then have um, a controlled drug just delivered exactly where it needs to be. I always end with this because um, one of these is pictures of my cells, the other is from Game of Thrones Battle of Backwater. So I figure if all else fails, I can go and do special effects with this stuff. Um, but yes, um, have you take any questions? Yes, so I worked in, um, actually when I was a student in a GMP facility and we were, um, I was part of the team that took a product, like, you know, developed the new method and took it all the way through to GMP and worked with FDA and that, which is terrifying. So much paperwork. <laughs> it's quite different from, like I said, I sidestepped into industry for a while and it's a very different environment I learned. Learn about all the paperwork. Yeah, no, commercialize. <laughs> Pardon? Commercialize the product. Definitely. If I if I think I've come up with something that's going to change lives, it may be a lot of work to get there, but I almost think it'd be wrong not to sh at least try to get that out. Uh, a lot of the issue actually currently with this sort of thing is to do with um, whether or not you take cells from your own body versus someone else's and um, make that into sort of an off-the-shelf cell line. Because a lot of the issue with spinal cord injury is the amount of secondary damage that continues to happen. You need to get this therapy to them within essentially the first 14 days just due to the damage that occurs. So that's a key part of the challenge and also hoping to do... Um, sort of repeat the cell line work, but with 
not quite a better genetic model, but the issue with the gene that we use is um, it is linked to estrogen, so it's not ideal for women. <laughs> so it'd be better to yeah, take that out and use something that's yeah, a bit more appropriate. Yes, so um, I said a lot of this work happened in UK, and um, UK they have something that's called the Human Tissue Act, and so essentially when you're using these cells, um, you have to know exactly where they are, you have to have everything associated with them, because they can come and audit you at any time, we need all the paper associated with these cells, and then ethical, ethically you need to know, you can't know essentially the name of the patient, but then if that patient comes to you and says, I don't want you to use my cells anymore. You still also have to be able to have some sort of anonymous system so you can you know what cells you then need to dispose of because they have the right to say no. We don't want these being used at any time. And then it also depends on what um, permissions you've got from the patient, so how to use those cells because um, you might have said initially, oh, I only want to use them for this, but then you're like, oh, this works really amazing. We can actually do more with these. You then need to be able to go back to the patient and make sure that you've got all that um, because obviously you have to have full consent for them no matter how you're using them. And so it also means you have to make good decisions initially as to how you're going to make that consent look. I'll be around afterwards anyway. Good <laughs> questions. Um, oh gosh, wasn't that um, sausage dog cute? Yeah. <laughs> Such a good boy. It's really cool to see... Um, you know, see the work being done to help animals, like with um, banjo as well, with the penguin. That's way far. So, um, next up we've got um, Professor uh, Mukundan from Computer Science and Software Engineering here at University of Canterbury. Um, so, he'll be talking to us about um, transformation of... You can tell that health health tech isn't my forte. Um, historic pathology. Oh, it's my bad. Sorry. Um, workflow using virtual slides and machine learning algorithms. Thank you, Mary. Uh, kia ora. Uh, in this uh, very short presentation, I will try to give a very brief overview of uh, the recent developments in the area of uh, digital pathology. Uh, I will talk a little bit about computational pathology uh, within the domain of digital pathology and um, I'll also uh, very briefly go over some of the research work we have been doing in this field. As the names of these fields uh, suggest, uh, these are very much interdisciplinary areas uh, where a close collaboration between clinical experts, uh, pathologists particularly, uh, and uh, experts in the field of machine learning, um, data science, and image analysis are required. So in order to understand the importance of digital pathology, let us uh, take a quick look at some of the web pages of the key market players uh, in this field. They all basically say the same thing. Uh, cancer uh, occurrences are growing and uh, there is a need for faster, more accurate, more efficient uh, ways of diagnosing cancer. And pathology labs should transition to digital, digital, uh, where one could uh, leverage the power of um, artificial intelligence, uh, 
and image analysis techniques for more effective uh, prediction of um, cancer uh, recurrence and also for uh, more accurate analysis of uh, the pathology slides. A very recent uh, market survey in this uh, area also highlights the uh, importance of computational pathology as the main catalyst uh, driving the growth in this market uh, and it uh, predicts that in the next few years uh, there will be a huge transformation in uh, the field of computational pathology. Pathology labs in New Zealand uh, primarily use the traditional um, microscopy, light microscopy based assessments. Uh, and because of the subjective nature of these assessments, there is always this inter-observer variability associated with these evaluations. There is also site transportation costs and uh, if you look at this from uh, a, the point of view of digital pathology or in the context of digital pathology, uh, we can consider these uh, slides as containers of a large amount of data and that data is trapped within these glass slides. This data could have been used in many, many ways. Uh, it could be used for improving diagnosis, it could be used for training, it could be used for several other applications. So a very basic digital pathology implementation would replace these light microscopes with a very high resolution whole slide image and uh, also with a very powerful user interface for viewing and annotating these images. So that's what I've shown here. Um, the evaluation primarily remains subjective or semi-quantitative, uh, but we have replaced the microscope with a very high resolution whole slide image. And this slide gives a, an example of uh, the basic properties of such an image. Uh, the image over here uh, has about uh, 50,000 pixels um, and the size is around 50,000 pixels by 90,000 pixels. And that roughly translates to around 4.5 billion pixels. And since the image area is very, very small, uh, 15 to 30 millimeters on a glass slide, we get a very high resolution of the order of 0.2 microns per pixel. This is a very high resolution image. And we have a large amount of data to deal with. But this data could be used in so many ways. It contains a lot of information about the objects and characteristics of the underlying tissue architecture. And having got this data, we can process it in many ways. We can use simple uh, image processing techniques to analyze the intensity values to get the stain characteristics as shown here. You can get the average um, hematoxylin and eosin stain uh, values and use them to get some form of a decomposition of the image in terms of stain channels. So if you separate the image, in terms of the stain channels, then you can derive a lot more useful information from each of the stain separated images. So this is just a very fundamental application of a basic digital uh, pathology system. There are many systems available in the market. Uh, some of them are free, some of them uh, provide only very basic functions uh, with a free version. Uh, we use the QPath uh, developed by the University of Edinburgh. It's a free software, it's open source, and it's quite powerful. powerful. It provides a lot of uh, basic features required for viewing and annotating uh, a whole slide image. 
So I'll show a, a quick example, a quick demo of um, this process of viewing uh, and annotating a whole slide image. So this is exactly the same image I showed earlier with these image parameters um, having about uh, 50,000 pixels by 90,000 uh, pixels resolution. And one could use these annotation tools uh, to select regions of interest and to um, extract some relevant information such as uh, nuclei regions. We can segment nuclei regions very easily. And uh, we can also uh, create boundaries uh, or uh, polygonal uh, curves around regions of interest so that we can crop them, we can segment them uh, or uh, perform some computations on them. And these computations normally provide a lot of information which uh, you can use for some form of statistical analysis. You can uh, gather information about uh, cell morphology or the distribution of cells within the whole slide image. Uh, you can collect the cell sizes, the orientation of cells, uh, and um, get uh, statistical data out of it. And that will be useful in many uh, slide evaluation processes. So what we have seen now is that the very basic DP solution has several advantages and it more than everything contains a huge amount of data, voluminous amount of data which could be used uh, for um, uh, providing information about uh, the heterogeneous histologic landscape that is represented by these uh, images. And more than everything, it can also provide or set the scene for um, applying machine learning and image analysis algorithms. So what I've shown here as an analyzer is uh, basically a collection of processes. Uh, this could be machine learning algorithms, it could be image analysis techniques or um, some application of data science methods for um, processing uh, features that are present in these images. Uh, usually we extract features, we quantify certain feature parameters and then use these parameters for classification uh, or uh, for quantifying some information that is re relevant to that uh, tissue. Uh, and um, basically uh, these are uh, image analysis and machine learning tools and pathologists could review this in addition to um, what uh, he or she sees on the screen uh, and uh, then arrive at a quantitative more accurate information about uh, the pathology slide. So I've shown here some examples of what we can achieve from these uh, very, whole, uh, very large whole slide images. Uh, we could um, segment uh, an image as shown uh, here. Uh, it could be a stain segmentation using simple color decon deconvolution. We could also extract uh, regions of interest. It could be tumor regions, stain regions, stromal areas, tubules, or nuclei. And from the distribution of nuclei parameters, we could uh, get histograms, um, their energy, entropy, and various texture-related parameters that could be useful for further classification of the slide. Pathomics is an emerging field. Uh, it uses these characterizations and quantified values uh, that are obtained from uh, a tissue image. So basically they deal with information uh, related to tumor growth or uh, cell morphology. 
and it could give us information from other sources of uh, other data sources such as genomics or um, even um, clinical informatics containing demographics about a patient. And computational pathology uses this data uh, with the help of machine learning algorithms and image analysis tools to derive more meaningful information, a richer uh, information set which could possibly uh, be useful in the pathologics field itself. So this, uh, this is actually a uh, double uh, ended arrow. Uh, so uh, computational pathology could also feed into pathologics provide more useful information for that particular area. So what are we doing in this field? Uh, our research group, the computer graphics and machine uh, and medical image analysis group in the Department of Computer Science and Software Engineering uh, is involved in uh, research work in primarily these three fields of uh, computer science, computer graphics, image analysis and machine classification. And we have been recently working on a few projects involving whole slide images, particularly uh, of uh, breast cancer uh, tissue samples. And these projects are undertaken with the help of grant from the Canterbury Medical Research Foundation, the Breast Cancer Foundation New Zealand, and the Health Research Council. And we have been closely working with uh, Dr. Gavin Harris, who is here, um, is an expert pathologist specializing in the field of uh, breast cancer. Uh, Dr. Gavin uh, Harris has been providing us uh, with uh, inputs, uh, guidance, and um, help throughout these uh, throughout the duration of, of these projects. So uh, basically, I just wanted to go over these um, uh, projects, but. Um, if, if you are interested in uh, knowing more about any of this, they all relate to breast cancer diagnosis. Um, we can discuss more about this because I'm aware of the time limitation. So I'll conclude with this uh, slide, a very brief uh, uh, quote from a very recent paper uh, that says that this is an area where a close collaboration between uh, pathologists and experts in the field of computer science are required to um, drive this um, research into the domain of computational pathology where uh, we can uh, derive a lot more meaningful information from that data that is trapped inside glass slides. Many pathology labs are transitioning to this computational pathology based assessments of um, glass slides um, to assist pathologists with the interpretation of these slides. Um, there is always a, there will always be a framework because so all these machine learning algorithms uh, again um, have uh, or are required to have that uh, explainable factor. You know, explainable AI is now becoming more and more important with the development of uh, techniques like this. So um, there will be uh, tools to visualize uh, the uh, in-between processes that are used for, let's say for example, classification so that the pathologist would be able to interpret them in a better way rather than just looking at a set of heat maps or data. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, uh, 
zoom and enhance on CSI must be that that sort of technology, I think, with 4.5 billion pixels. Um, awesome. So next up we have um, Sue Powles from um, Callahan Innovation. Um, so she'll talk to us about the, um, how the university can be a conduit for um, companies such as yourselves uh, to engage with students from all levels, from undergraduate to PhD, um, in order to grow your capability. Hello, um, I'm Sue Powers and I work at Callaghan Innovation here in Christchurch and have been doing this job for some years so um, it's quite amazing some of the things I've seen in the time I've been doing it and just when I was sitting there I was just thinking how complex health is and how many different areas there are and where people get up to in the biological space versus the medical devices space so um, Callaghan is trying to do a lot more in the health space, um, probably more in the medical device space though because it's an area that we can see there is possibility for New Zealand to grow its capability. So I'll just go through Callaghan uh, in a high level and what we do. Um, you probably have heard of us, we have a group of scientists um, which are the research and development scientists and alongside that sits uh, people like myself that work usually with businesses that are wanting to develop new products. Part of our um, uh, initiatives that we've got going is the Health Tech Activator, and I'll talk about that next. Um, we have traditionally, and we still have project grants where we help companies that are developing a product. Um, we have student grants, which I'll talk to as well a bit later, and that's a good way um, like we've just heard around trying to connect universities and students to companies. And we also de have developed some innovation skills, which is helping companies learn how to, not so much innovate, but areas that they, that they would benefit from understanding more. Um, innovation IP is one, and lean manufacturing, which is another. We also have a couple of others, which I won't go into. So if we talk about the Health Tech Activator, now I have to try and get to this, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, this was set up because we realised that, um, just as Debbie said, the, the, the amount of, oh thank you, the amount of um, learning that a company has to do to get to in any way a product that can be launched into the commercial field is just overwhelming. And when we went out and um, surveyed companies and, and looked at the sector, we realised there were four or five key things that companies have to learn and that's around capital education, getting money to keep developing, market validation is a really um, big area that we want to concentrate on, um, reimbursement strategies, if you're going into uh, the US um, there's codes that you need to understand it, and that can sometimes even uh, give you a um, pathway that you'll develop through to, regulatory pathway, whether it be uh, within the EU or um, in other jurisdictions like uh, the US, there's, there's regulatory pathways you have to know, and clinical validation, which is the clinical um, trials that you have to undertake. So when you look at all those things combined, you can see why it's, it's actually a big job. <laughs> so just sort of thinking about um, the HTA, no, I don't know if I can stop this, I don't know if you want it to keep going, but anyway, um, if you think of the HTA, we have resources under some of these um, uh, points up the top where anyone can come and subscribe to it and there are uh, things in the regulatory pathway that will give you an understanding, a brief understanding, will give you the, the starter pack sort of thing. So that, I really urge anyone who's interested in health and especially in the medical devices area to go in and subscribe. We have, um, we, we're putting more content up there and behind these um, categories all the time. And so it, it, that's the starter model. The other thing is that as we get companies coming to us and they are moving through their um, journeys, for want of a better word, is we're developing up uh, more in-depth resources and one of those is with 
market validation, which I can't actually, sorry, I can't, I haven't got a, a, a I, I wouldn't mind just clicking on that. Oh, right, I'm just clicking on it. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so this was an area that um, I've always seen people struggle when they come to us with project grant funding and they're telling us about how they know this product will be good in the market. So at the moment we're doing a um, in-depth uh, market validation piece where we're trialling about six or eight companies and we're taking them through a very um, uh, a process of them being able to think about how they uh, actually look at the market they've got, but to keep going out to the market to develop validate what the product is and if if potential customers want it. So, um, and in that we've got other services that we can help them with. Um, we've got library services that can do in-depth searches um, and that's a free service uh, around uh, market validation, either the technology or the actual market you're going into. Um, we have uh, a um, globaldata.com is um, a uh, something we subscribe to now and again that's more on a global sense and it's a, an organisation that is just completely focused on market validation so that's something that we can offer. Um, in the beginning it's just this trial that we're doing or this pilot but hopefully we can keep expanding it um, and the other thing that we have is GLC Network where these are a global set of experts in the market validation or market commercialisation side that we can link them up with around specific questions they may have. So we're about oh, only one month into a three month sort of pilot and yeah, it's looking pretty good. Good. It's giving um, these companies a lot more understanding of what it takes. So yeah, if, if you know of companies that um, uh, in this space, please get them to have a look at that. Um, now, okay, to go out of here, go back to here, I think. Yep. Nope. Go back now. Do your presentation. Yep. All right. Okay. So, just um, briefly to talk about students, because this is a way that. Um, many companies that I've dealt with over the years, uh, sometimes they're a bit hesitant, but once they get on board with what students can give them, it's a fantastic resource. So um, for helping the companies, brings new skills, helps with their recruitment. For students, it gives them real world experience, which is great. And for tertiary education um, providers, it gives them a pathway for students to move through into companies if that's if that's what they want to do. Um, so the student grants, we have three student grants, so um, it hasn't been announced yet and we are pretty much sure it's going to happen this year. The R&D experience grants are like the summer interns where we will pay for a student to go into a company uh, and pay for 40 hours, um, you know, eight, ten weeks of them working in the company. Now to note here, um, it's a little bit expanded than what it was um, in previous years. Um, it can be design and business students that could come in and do a piece of work for a company. So um, that's a very simple, easy way to start to link into the university or into graduates. And another important thing with that, you can uh, this can be applied to anyone from first year right through to when they're finishing their PhD. So you can get students along the way. Now a lot of people do this to sort of, companies do this to say, oh yeah, this guy's really good. And to give you an example, a company here in town, um, OSIS, which you're probably well aware of, um, they do um, titanium implants, custom titanium implants. Well, the first time they have this last summer, they employed a software engineer and they've just found it absolutely um, opened their eyes to all sorts of things that they can do because they've just been focused on doing these implants. So he's in there trying to develop some software to help them with their processes and that he has some other ideas. So a, a great example. Um, fellowship grants are for, 
for students that are wanting to do a master's or PhD and we get alongside them um, with the company, the university and the student and give them a stipend to help them through that. They have to work a bit of time in the company because we're wanting to give them commercial experience. And last but not least, the career grad career grants which are graduates that have come out of a master's or PhD and it's their first job into a company and we will pay their first six months of salary. So it's a good de-risking for the company to, to again get to know these students. Um, so yep and that's about it really but I'm really happy to take questions and yeah I feel like I talk very fast sorry. <laughs> I'll be around anyway. Cool, thank you so much for that. I could multitask. Um, so next up we have Graham Tappan from Cedra Express. Um, so uh, Graham will talk us through the, uh, the effects of recent issues caused by COVID-19 and how Cedra Express has been able to overcome these obstacles. Uh, good evening everyone and uh, thank you very much for having us here today. It's an absolute honour and privilege and thank you Mary for the invite. Um, so Cedra Express is an elite medical career, we're New Zealand owned and 20 years old this year and our role has been to keep clinical trials and medical logistics running in New Zealand both domestically and internationally. So prior to COVID level 4 there was over 900 flights both passenger and cargo coming into New Zealand each week um, into Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch. Come level four, we dropped down to about 15 flights and they were purely cargo only, so no passengers were allowed on the flights. Uh, the airlines um, went into panic mode for a start and after that panic mode finished, they dramatically increased their rates and we saw rates to Europe and America triple overnight. In fact, a lot of the airlines in New Zealand didn't know what to charge initially, so up went the rates. Um, come March 2021, we have seen some increases in frequency of flights, back to about 55 per week, and now, of course, with the trans tasman bubble, we're seeing some uh, passenger flights coming in and out to all the airports, which is really good. That will help uh, both the transportation of clinical trials and medication into and out of New Zealand. The Air New Zealand network with Level 4 dropped dramatically down to, well, they took out 95% of their flights and on day one at level four, in fact, there was no flights at all until the New Zealand and the government talked to each other to try and establish what they could do and how Air New Zealand could help the government to keep critical services working throughout the domestic network in New Zealand. Um, internationally, Air New Zealand uh, cancelled all their services and were only offering charter flights out of Auckland and Christchurch overseas. There was a lot of charter flights that went up to China to bring back the uh, personal protection equipment and there was, they were flying all their 787s. They grounded their 777s, the old 777s, straight away, and were flying their 787s just because they were more fuel efficient and better configured for cargo. Um, in regionally in New Zealand, um, we had no flights to places like Dunedin and Nelson and Napier and Palmerston North, and uh, that had a dramatic effect on blood shipments moving around and also medication coming in. Um, the problem we had with medication, medication kept coming in on the, on the cargo flights, but how did you get it from, say, Auckland to Wellington when there was one flight a day and the flight went in the morning and the international flight arrived at lunchtime? So we started to um, create a network of, with our drivers in Auckland and Christchurch and we would dispatch them each day. So the, the driver from Christchurch would meet our driver from Timaru and Omaru. They would do a swap of medication and blood samples and then they might go up through uh, Marara down to Queenstown, for example. So we had drivers moving all throughout New Zealand. Um, likewise, in the North Island, our driver in Rotorua would come up to Tirao and meet our driver from Tauranga, who would come, another driver from Auckland would come down. So we had to create ideas and, and create solutions to, to keep uh, the, particularly the bloods moving. So some labs were still processing bloods from patients and some weren't. 
So a lot of the patients that were on clinical trials also had to remain at home. They weren't allowed to come into the private um, <laughs> places to do, to do their testing, but they had to keep on their medication. So we started getting calls from medical researchers saying, could we please deliver temperature-controlled drugs to places all around New Zealand? So um, with our facility in Christchurch, we're GDP compliant, so we can distribute pharmaceuticals uh, through processes that have been developed by the World Health Organization, and we started doing daily temperature control shipments throughout New Zealand. So that kept the, the medication going to patients that were on clinical trials. Um, onboard couriers, of course, no passengers on planes, so no onboard couriers could um, bring cell treatments in from Europe, for example. They used to come in with onboard couriers. They'd be checked in the um, dry shippers that run at a minus 180 would sit down below with cargo, but there'd be a passenger on board that was responsible to recover that shipment when they arrived into New Zealand. So we started seeing a lot of dry shippers coming in as express cargo, and we would clear them in Christchurch or in Christchurch and deliver them to the, to the final destination. Um, we had to really come up with some great solutions to keep products moving throughout New Zealand, and um, particularly for the, the patients on clinical trials and overseas. Uh, any questions, please? It's because of the value of the product that goes inside the dry, dry shippers. I mean, the dry shippers are um, liquid nitrogen at minus 180, and it's normally very, very high priority uh, shipments like the cells, for example, that, that the client is happy to pay for a specialised service with an onboard courier. It's very, very expensive to obviously have a person on board a plane uh, with the product downstairs, um, but it was seen as a, almost a guaranteed service, door-to-door -door service, to, to get shipments from point A to point B. It was, it was incredibly hard because we went from the day before level four to an almost normal service to the next day of having no services. And, um, and in fact, we didn't really know at that point what was going to happen, whether we would still have collections from the laboratories. Um, the airline, the international airlines didn't have a schedule out. It was very, very unknown what, what their schedule was. Um, you know, Singapore Airlines would keep flying in one. Well, in fact, in the early days, Singapore Airlines only bought in their 747 freighter three times a week. Um, was the only source. Qantas kept their 767 freighter going each day, but they were very restricted just to fly from Sydney to Auckland down to Christchurch and back to Sydney. And uh, then, of course, it would break down because it was getting used so often. And uh, then there'd be engineering involved, and of course, the parts would be overseas, and they couldn't get the parts in. So it, it, there was a lot of a lot of challenges. Um, a lot of challenges. And of course, the the freighter planes that, for example, Qantas operated um, are very old aircraft. You know, they're old. The old 767s and A330s, and they're not that. A lot of the planes weren't used to working 24/7. They would work most days, but there would be times where they could do their engineering and maintenance and things like that. So um, when COVID came along, the the planes were pure, pure freight planes. And you you see with the Emirates, for example, they've dropped from their A380s down to their down to their 777s um, just to carry the pure pure cargo. The one thing we'd like to see is the rates come down for, for researchers because <laughs> we're, we're, hoping, we're hoping with the increase in passenger services now that the airlines will slowly start to reduce their, their freight charges um, because at the end of the day it's the researchers and the clients that end up paying the, the increased costs. Um, so that's the most important thing. For us, you know, over the 20 years that we've been in business, we've, we're all about customer service and, and robust systems and people rely on us to get things from A to B whether it's um, ambient, 15 to 25, 2 to 8 degree, or dry ice, or the liquid, you know, the, the dry shippers. So we had good systems in place. Um, obviously with the, with the earthquakes, we, we learnt a lot from those to be, to be up in the cloud with a lot of systems, with the emails, our freight forwarding system, um, bookings with the airlines and things. So we've, we've learnt a lot over the 20 years, and when COVID came along, um, the only impact that we had to work through was the, the lack of flights. And, um, and making sure, and of course with the ambient blood samples, they have a very short lifespan for testing. 
So we, we had some from, say, for example, New Zealand to Singapore. We could go overnight with, um, with blood shipments on the Singapore service. They cancelled that. They brought in their freighters three times a week. So ambient blood samples all of a sudden went from 24 hours transit to maybe 72 hours transit. So they were right on the edge of their testing, testing capabilities. That's a good question. Thank you. We we had a lot of calls from a lot of people on that on that first day wanting wanting our help in New Zealand. So, in fact, um, some of our opposition even called us and said, "Could we help them with with drives?" Because um, a lot of a lot of couriers all of a sudden started sending drivers out left, right, and centre, and we'd be at the airport picking up medication, and there'd be a driver going, one of our drivers might be going to Nelson, one to Dunedin, and our opposition were going to Dunedin as well to the same people. So we started working with each other behind the scenes. Just it was not good. You know, send two people the same direction. So, so there was a little bit of working together and um, under those under that situation. Yeah. Do you think that you can you keep that collaboration going, or is that not viable? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. We were certainly happy to help and make it work right at under level four. But now that we're you know we're back to um, we we our business came back very quickly logistically. Um, so we, we had our staff back, our, a lot of our staff worked from home on their laptops, um, on emails and of course mobile phones and things, but we, we came back very quickly because the, the volume of um, clinical trials going out and the medication coming in kept going. And also New Zealand's seen as a very good country now to do clinical trials and you know, we have quite a diverse range of population. Um, MedSafe is a good government body to work with, um, great researchers and great facilities. And um, we've seen a dramatic increase in clinical trials going out of New Zealand. So as bloods go out, more medication comes in. So, um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Murray. Thank you, everyone. Some good questions. It's interesting all of the um, kind of carry-on issues that that happened due to COVID that I wouldn't have even thought of. Was that thing? So that was really interesting. Thank you. So next up, um, we have uh, Dr. Reza Shurangis from um, New Zealand Brain Research Institute, um, and he'll be talking to us about the application of <laughs> electro help me out, someone <laughs> EEGs. Um, <laughs> his research focuses on the um, in and oh my gosh, analytical and quantitative methods of EEG analysis, um, as well as the integration of machine learning. Oh, yeah, as well as integration of machine learning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about EEG. Um, <laughs> so. Just, just a quick um, background on that. So electroencephalogram or EEG is um, the electrodes that they put on the scalp and basically measures the electrical activity of the brain. Um, the good things about it is that it does have a really high temporal resolution. Um, it's relatively cheap. Um, it's non-invasive as, as long as we're using the actual AEG. Um, it's really good for processing the high level brain processes, but um, it lacks optimal um, spatial resolution. And so it does have some limitations on, um, on that. So um, comparatively, when we look at it um, compared to the functional MRI, or um, positron emission tomography, or near infrared spectroscopy, and so on. Um, EEG and MEG, uh, magnetoencephalogram, um, they have very good um, or ideal temporal resolution, but in terms of the spatial resolution, this, um, they are not so great. So we can detect things on the cortex. Um, 
potentially things that are relatively close um, to the scalp, but not very deep. So the way that people use them in the past, so as part of the neuroscience, because people were um, interested in understanding what happens when we pay attention to something, or um, how does brain behave when we inhibit from responding to something. So they designed different types of experiments, and most of them were based on um, what we call event-related potentials. Um, so these are studies that the participant sees a series of um, stimuli. They either respond or don't respond. It could be visual, it could be auditory. Um, and so depending on that, um, basically the average over multiple trials and they get a waveform um, kind of like up and down kind of like that, P1, N1, and the naming is basically based on first positive, um, first negative, and P1 is P100, happens around 100 milliseconds, and so on. Um, so each one of those um, peaks have been associated with some um, kind of brain function um, and brain processes. And it's very robust, so, so with um, so many research have um, used this and they got similar results that um, it's, it's very robust. Um, so more recently, um, not, not recently, but um, it's more applicable here, um, people have started using um, steady state visually um, evoked potentials. So what this does is that it flashes images and flashing images um, entrains neurons around the visual cortex. And so then those start oscillating at a certain frequency. Um, so if we have four different images that are oscillating at different frequencies, we know which one the person is looking at. So without even touching um, the, a keyboard or something, we know what they are doing. So I'm just going to play this. Um, it's not mine. I downloaded it from YouTube. Um, but it does have um, flashing videos. So the four are um, oscillating at different frequencies. And so based on the one that the person's looking at, um, the computer knows. So over time, it aggregates. Um, um, a length of data, calculates frequency, um, decomposition, and understands. So this one is a um, visual speller, speller. And so um, basically, yeah, for people who are locked in or disabled or something, they can just use this with a computer. And basically, by looking at different choices, they can actually um, kind of transfer that to the computer. So here, the person is actually um, spelling the name of the company. And so he's just looking at the four different ones. And over time, um, it detects, the computer detects which one he's looking at. So the whole idea of the brain-computer interface is we have electrodes over the brain, we collect data, um, we convert those EEG signals into features, um, either frequency, temporal, complexity, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we understand what the person wanted to do, and then we translate that into the device. So um, there are um, robots that are being controlled just by looking at different um, stimuli, and so on and so forth. And so for EEG, we put them on the scalp. Um, we have the ECOG that goes under the scalp, and, diff, um, and then we have the local field potentials that they have to put the electrode deep down. So the way it works is 
we have the, mainly we have the two types. It's either working based on the um, kind of a P300 style, which here, so they see a series of events and um, depending on whether they are looking at it or not, it creates a different waveform. Or it's a flashing light and depending on whether they are looking at it or not, um, we get a um, frequency component at a certain frequency. And there are so many different ways of analyzing this. Um, so the brain-computer interface is becoming more and more um, ubiquitous and yeah, it's now everywhere. So, so I'm a researcher, so most of my research is um, focused on neurological disorders, specifically Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's disease is the second most um, <clears throat> the second most common neurodegenerative disorder. Um, one of my colleagues did an epidemiology study a couple of years ago, and I think the uh, the current um, number of people affected by Parkinson's is New Ze in New Zealand is about twenty thousand, and they've estimated that to double by twenty forty to about forty thousand. Um, the main reason is Parkinson's is the, the is a disease of age, and so now the population is aging everywhere across the globe, and therefore um, we're going to see more of um, these um, neurological disorders. So we've done this um, kind of similar thing with our participants. Um, so we showed them is a series of images. Some of them are happening very frequent. Um, and then there are two types of infrequent um, stimuli. One, they have to respond to it by clicking a button, and one, they don't. And strangely enough, we didn't find any differences within them. Um, I have a feeling that it's because we are, at that point, we were working only with um, Parkinson's patients who have um, normal cognition. The problem with Parkinson's is, over time, the cognition deteriorates and um, about, if survived, um, about 80 or 90 percent of patients would get to dementia within about 20 years of the diagnosis. So that's not a good thing. At this point in time, we don't have a cure for it. We have medication for um, motor symptoms, but nothing for the cognitive side of it. So then <clears throat> we, we moved on, and so we started looking at resting state. What happens when they are resting, when they are just sitting down, close their eyes, and that's it. We record the data when they are relaxed but awake. So when we do some um, analysis, and we get the frequency components. And here is the average across participants. Um, so there is a trend. Um, we can see that these um, kind of peaks of the frequency um, spectrum kind of slowly goes back. So the blue line is the healthy control rate is the Parkinson's disease, normal cognition. Um, green is the mild cognitive impairment and black is dementia. And so we can see that that slowly goes back. And that is um, one of the markers. So if we look at that um, kind of frequency of the peak across everyone, and we look at it, we see that it actually is slowing down as participants go from normal cognition to dementia. So that could be a biomarker or, or a marker of um, cognitive decline. Whether that's associated with future cognition, we don't know. Um, and that's why um, I'm currently working 
on this project in, in addition to functional MR and structural MR and all of the other ones funded by Neurological Foundation and HRC um, to get the, the other parts sorted. But the other um, interesting thing is, so the alpha power, so some one of the activities on the occipital cortex or the back of the head um, is very dominant when people close their eyes. So if you are awake, close your eyes, you see some activity here. And when you open your eyes, that goes away. Um, so when we look at different participants, different groups, so we can see that here for healthy controls, it's there. When we go to PDN, it goes slightly smaller. For PDMCI, it goes even slightly smaller. And for PDDs, it's not there. Um, so that's potentially another marker for cognition in, in Parkinson's disease. Um, and so when we look at the proportion of that alpha power in the back of the brain, we can actually see that here, now we have a larger difference between controls and PDNs and to the lesser extent um, as it goes to dementia. So the question is, can we actually use this um, as a marker of um, cognition in Parkinson's disease? I'm working on that. Yeah. So we can look at um, functional connectivity, which what it means is basically we're looking at two different electrodes, look at the activity of two, um, whether they are um, basically oscillating with a, with a similar delay or different delay um, over time. And we can see as um, uh, kind of Parkinson's disease progresses to dementia, um, some of the connectivity in delta band and theta band increases, but in alpha band it decreases. So that's um, kind of what I'm working with um, Parkinson's disease. On the side, um, I'm working on, on, on another one, which is basically um, a, an indicator of performance. So whether people are going to fall asleep, yes or no. And so for to do that, we have this experiment, and participants are supposed to follow the line. And as you can see, this participant is going to just quickly fall asleep. And this, yeah, this happens in real life um, when we are driving. Sometimes. Um, This person is, is a young, healthy person. Um, this is about 2 p.m. And I, I think at the time he was a postdoc. So um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not um, that I say they, they have anything um, wrong. No, this person, after doing it for 20 minutes, he just starts falling asleep because it's very tiring. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, as part of my other research, um, which um, a few of my students are doing this, um, we define a gold standard by rating the by rating that. We take the EEG, continuous EEG, when we are recording it. Um, take a segment just prior to the event of microsleep and try to see, can we actually predict it as we go? And so far, yes, we can, is, um, depending on the measure that we use, we can, um, up to an um, accuracy of about 60%. With the, um, yeah, so if, if you know receiver characteristic, um, receiver operating char characteristic, the area under the curve is about 0.95, but still, it's the performance is not great. But we are working on it as well. So, 
So, in conclusion, um, I'm just going to highlight that EEG is, is, is a really um, important tool. And yes, it's been used in the past for um, scientific and the science part of neuroscience to understand what's happening underneath. But I think we can now start using it in more real life applications and try to um, use it as markers for um, neurological disorders, rehabilitation, um, epilepsy, um, autism, depression, and so on and so forth. And it's great because it's direct measure of neural activity and it's non-invasive and relatively cheap. Thank you. I know that um, there are research in traumatic brain injury, um, but I personally haven't worked on concussion. I've worked with um, anesthetic agents, but not with concussion. Yeah, how does your work compare to the um, progress that uh, Elon Musk and his Neuralink uh, project is, is doing? Is that the sort of direction you think this could go? That's a good question. That one is, I'm actually not sure where that one's going. And um, I have a feeling that we won't know until a device comes out and says, we are doing this. Um, so, so I can't compare with that. But we are trying to do a similar approach, but more clinical um, practice. Yep. Um, this research has been going on for a long time. Yeah. Um, what So, we were working on that, um, so we were designing a head cap that, that could be worn and we wanted to um, integrate it with some microcontrollers and put the software on top of it so it actually detects, for example, um, when, when a person is going to fall asleep during driving. So there are two issues with that. Another company um, released the cap earlier than we could have, and therefore um, we can't get the intellectual property for the cap, we can only get the intellectual property for um, the algorithm, which actually is for the most part copyright. The second part is we need to get ethical approval to be able to test that on human subjects in real life, and I'm not actually sure if we can do that at least in New Zealand. It just seems like the research has been going on for a very long time with um, no return in a sense of their truck, their truck driving um, uh, uh, products now where they measure eye movement, they measure all these sort of things and they can start to tell that's developed in New Zealand. Yep. But where is yours going? Because I got very excited about this years ago yeah, I mean, there are some limitations to this. Yeah. Um, I know that um, there are other research going on to, to do a similar thing for pilots. Yeah. Um, just to make sure that they don't fall asleep. Yeah. Um, How yeah. I think I think the main problem is funding. Um, for the Parkinson's disease side of things, um, we got really fortunate to get the funding from Neurological Foundation to, to begin with. It was a brain research New Zealand to start something which then Neurological Foundation supported it. And then um, Health Research Council um, kind of came in and supported um, that research. So, so on that side, we were really lucky. Um, for the microsleep side, it's basically um, has, it's, it's a slowed down quite a bit because we had to transfer a lot of things to students and students, it, it's a, um, quite a bit of overhead 
for them to get a grasp of how things work. And by the time that they get to the end of second year of their PhDs, they just want to finish out. And so they only have about a year and a half, maybe two years at max, to, to get to speed, um, do something, and then finish. And that's one of the limitations, at least for the um, microsleep side. <laughs> Yeah, I I used I did that for my PhD, um, to begin with, and yeah, I had to move on to something else because there was no money there, and yeah, I I had to get something to pay the bill. So uh, next up, we have uh, Michael Dury from Hico Unlimited. Um, so Michael is a co-founder and marketing lead of Hico Unlimited, um, which is a local technology-led venture um, formed in 2020 um, to create uh, stored portable energy products um, and solutions for use in the humanitarian emergency health response and mobile telecommunication sectors. Fantastic. Well, it's uh, interesting, and thank you, everyone, for for bearing with us uh, at this stage, um, holding you up before uh, um, a break. But uh, we, we heard from uh, Reza about the um, EEG, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the EED, which is uh, our uh, take on what we call the electronic energy device. Um, and uh, I have to say, Hico uh, is a very new company. It was only formed... Uh, probably 18 months ago, if that, over a beer, as they often do, uh, sort of entrepreneurial kind of groupings got together and uh, had an idea around uh, the need for uh, taking a sort of a, a, an idea around energy, and particularly around the battery energy, which uh, some of you, I'm sure, uh, have interest in. Uh, and this is how it applies within the health tech sector as well. So what I'll be covering off uh, over the next... Uh, we while is really just how we saw the future for uh, health, clean energy and emergency communications and work particularly with UC to make a difference. And also how we uh, you know, look at the global energy, climate change and battery tech and why it matters because they, they are sort of all part of, of the issues that we face as uh, human beings in today's world and particularly uh, the global energy one and, uh, and uh, certainly with climate change impacting on that. And thirdly, the challenges facing energy and the need for portable power in our health, health tech sector. Um, so just to sort of um, look at that and the collaboration that we had with uh, UC to create new tech solutions, particularly for the New Zealand Red Cross, which I'll cover off uh, along the way as well in the emergency service sector. This, I guess the starting point is really never waste the opportunities offered by a good crisis, uh, as Macchio Valley said. And, uh, you know, we've had that over the last year or so, more so than probably in any time we can really relate to. And is climate change affecting our health, given it's a health tech uh, uh, theme? Well, according to 63% Ameri uh, of Americans, they do believe it is impacting, and it does have tangible and actual uh, impacts on uh, daily life. The refugee sector is another one that is really impacted by all of this, and it's the mental impacts, it's the effect on our e economy, it's the effect on, um, I guess, our future, which is really more around how do we gear up and act around that. So energy and climate change are not mutually exclusive, they are very much entwined, and we looked at that in terms of, OK, you've got limited resources in the world, water, energy, food, land, and they're called the planetary nexuses. And these are more eco-friendly opportunities and trade-offs, on, particularly on energy supply and how use emerges from considering these for core resources, such as food, water, energy and land, particularly with a growing population. And so the population impact and growth is make, placing stress on infrastructure and on things like energy, climate and those sorts of things. And obviously on our health services, and even today's announcement about DHBs, I didn't want to drop it in, but I thought, well, it's very topical it's very real, here it is, you know, we have to face some of those changes and impacts that we need to gear up for. 
So the efforts to lift our power generation and electrical grid into the 21st century requires a multi-pronged approach. It needs, a, I guess, a new generation mix of low carbon sources that include hydro, renewable, solar power and many others, and ways to capture carbon that is affordable and makes the grid smart. If you look at the world energy consumption by energy source, you'll see, and this was taken back to 1990, that the one that stands out for me is the, is the renewables, and I actually think it's tracking up even further because you know, we're seeing this sort of hockey stick approach that um, renewables have now become a strong focus and they're driven by the need to be carbon neutral in a much quicker time. And I guess when we looked at why we set up HECO, the, the why question was very much how do we fit within the sustainable goals of the UN? Because these are really what are driving political, economic and social changes and community changes needed to really address the future. And uh, health is very much in there, but so too are all these other aspects within there. And I guess the other thing is really the, the, um, the congruence between climate change becoming the world's biggest problem, but deep, deep tech is one of the solutions, you know, and that's why I got involved in this, uh, this industry, this business, and why I'm very proud to be part of, you know, working with uh, um, our partners such as Callahan's and, and the university and others to really make a difference. Because it does, uh, you know, drive a lot of the resonance, if you like, within the health tech sector. Um, if you think of the effects of climate change, uh, more storms, more drought, fires, it's, it's around us. And you, I'd hate to say, can't deny that there are some impacts driven by a lot of it. And how could it change and impact the world? Well, some of it is basically, if you look at deaths from disease by 2030, malaria, malnutrition, diarrhoea, heat stress, and also air pollution has a direct impact on uh, you know, up to 7 million deaths from that. Um, the costs are significant, you know, 2 to 4 billion costs, but you know, it's, it's, it's the WHO, I guess, view of what is going to happen when, when we start to hit the wall, and what is it going to have the impact on our, on our own health of that and that of our children. So I just wanted to sort of bring that to the fore, and particularly what's going on at the moment. Because in an uncertain world with spreading pandemic and climate stress, there's growing demand for faster, more reliable health response teams and support systems. And that's where our sort of business uh, vision comes in. Because we see ourselves as part of the uh, solution that would help emergency and health responders provide 24-7 fail-safe equipment, and much of this requires portable energy power that won't let them down. If you take, for instance, a typical ambulance or the typical uh, uh, field hospital, Everything that's in that requires some form of portable or transportable energy system or source. And that's what we've been sort of, what's keeping us up at night. You know, how do we actually address some of those needs that sit within everything from, uh, you know, life support systems to oxygen therapy, suction pumps, all, pumps, all of these things, particularly when they're out in the field or in the, on the road. And that's uh, drove, I guess, our, our first um, requirement to say, well, you know, where do we sit in this world? And if you think of um, the environments that are out there, hospital, uh, remote health care, um, the use of uh, GPS and all the other things, systems, a lot of it is mobile, it is uh, uh, fast moving and it does require energy systems and services that really get out there and can perform. And uh, they already exist, I'm not saying that you know they're not there, but there are some certain limitations, hence why we faced the issue that we did. And we built or have built a prototype around uh, uh, an energy system in a, in a suitcase type thing. Um, but um, it, it is evolving, and it's evolving very fast. We've only been working on this for less than a year. So um, it's still very much early days. But what drove, drove the question came about because batteries, if you think, take talk batteries for a minute, the future is very big. It's, it's, a, it's, it's taking a lot of air space and air time. People are thinking a lot about you know, what are the energy needs of the future? If we're going to Mars, how are we going to get there and come back again safely on uh, propulsion? You know, what is going to keep us alive? What is going to keep us there and, and keep going? The global market uh, forecasts are pretty significant, and there's a heck of a lot of technology platforms from lead ash, acid, lithium ion, nickel metal, uh, hydrogen battery, nickel, you know, there's so many different ones, and you're seeing more and more. <laughs> Uh, developments coming out every single day. We're playing a bit in this space and, and you know, we believe we, we've found a bit of a niche in some of this area that we, we think is quite exciting. And certainly the automotive sector, industrial, portable uh, systems, 
they take up a lot of time and focus from uh, entrepreneurs, from researchers and businesses and investors. But um, I guess where we sat was saying, well, at the moment batteries are fairly traditional, they're quite chemically uh, driven, very uh, you know, slow energy storage. We have what we call ultra capacitors, solid state type batteries coming in, and these are faster, um, they tend to kick up a lot more, but they also drop and they're not quite as reliable. Where we see the niche is really for a, what we call an EED, an electronic device, that offers the best of both platforms, solid state hybrid technology. And um, I'm not going to go too much into the technology of it, but where ultra capacitors, um, uh, lithium ion batteries and, and traditional, we're sort of seeing ourselves sit in this space here as we move the technology uh, dial. And the reason that um, it excited us is that um, there are certain areas that are good niches to exploit as a business here in New Zealand. Um, we're not trying to um, compete with the General Motors and the Teslas of the world and some of those. Our focus is very much on how do we take the ultra capacitor core sort of uh, benchmark as it is to now and actually go one step beyond. Uh, and um, we developed a solid state EED, EED prototype for Red Cross in the last 12 months um, to provide reliable and powerful energy. It's still in prototype stage, so I can't show you the product as it is now, but it's still evolving. But when we um, talked to Red Cross, it was really around their response needs in the field. Um, and that's one of their uh, objectives around disaster <coughs> risk management. And they uh, approached one of our partners and, and one of the directors in the company uh, back in late 2019 to solve a need for safe, portable and reliable power units to support their infield telecommunication system. So we're looking predominantly around applications in the telecoms uh, mobile communications area, particularly when responding to emergencies that can occur anytime, anywhere. Take earthquakes, take, for example, tsunami effects, that type of thing. So whenever Red Cross deploy a humanitarian aid station in a remote area and they need to fly in telecommunications equipment, which may be transmitters, receivers, aerials, walkie-talkies, base stations, that type of thing, they're, under, they're prohibited under current aviation law from taking these with them on planes. And uh, anyone who's dealt with the CAA will know that it's a pretty tricky thing, particularly with lithium-ion uh, batteries as it is. Chemically-based batteries, lead-acid, lithium and so on, larger than uh, 100 watt-hours, are not permitted by CAA to be transported on planes. And that's a bit of a problem if you have to get into the field very, very quickly. And, uh, you know, there are some horror stories about exploding batteries, as I'm sure you know. But what it meant was that we had to really understand what the, what the op opportunity was here. How do we solve it? You know? And so um, I guess the, the, the why question is, because they're unable to transport batteries, they need to provision at their provision these uh, telecommunication uh, set systems at the site and the time delays could become quite uh, dramatic. So we looked at it as a solution, if you like, around non-chemical portable power unit that complies and is transportable on planes, attach it to the current transmitter or receiver used by Red Cross or others and if a market exists and potentially Red Cross International plus other fast response uh, uh, organisations, and there are many of them, that, that was a sort of a, I guess, a vertical niche we thought could be expanded and developed. And it's, as I say, early days. But the product benefits would enable it to provide, I guess, a longer life uh, unit, able to operate at extreme temperature um, uh, extremities, and be rapid charging. And the, um, I guess, the, the what we call the uh, starting point for us was to create an electronic device or energy device um, because most existing ones are lithium and lead acid, they use a chemical reaction to generate electricity, creates heat, heat causes uh, you know, bad impacts, and uh, sometimes this can really go the next stage. You know. so, so we know that um, current technology has limitations, low safety rating sometimes, unable to operate at very high or low temperatures, and a relatively short lifespan, require high levels of maintenance and take extended time to charge. So, you know, just looking at this little uh, um, uh, uh, GIF, it shows, I guess, an exploding lithium battery that might be in your watch, in your laptop, whatever, but it is, uh, I guess, a, a, I guess a, a true indi indicator of the risk factor of having these things transportable by air. 
So our answer was to develop a, uh, a device that could operate at very high or low temperatures, no risk of overheat and catching fire, is air safe and is, has a longer life uh, than current chemical battery technology and can be charged 10 times quicker than batteries as well. Um, so that's still an aspiration, I have to be honest, because we're still testing the, uh, the theory. Um, but we had to work with a trusted partner. Who better than our UC College of Engineering uh, undergrads? Um, we uh, engaged them a year ago, just as COVID lockdown kicked in. So it was a very good time, uh, timeliness, but great Zoom uh, meetings all over. And there's, there's, uh, there's the team from last year. Um, so what we worked with them consistently over those months was really to help develop a prototype box like the one that Rebecca's holding there. And um, I just wanted to sort of shift gears and have her talk a little bit about it because rather than listen to me explain things, um, I'll just run to a little short video that we had produced uh, last year and hopefully this will run and you can hear it again. My name is Rebecca Lindsay and I'm studying a Bachelor of Engineering majoring in Electrical and Electronics at the University of Canterbury. My name is Michael Drury, I'm one of the co-founders and directors of HECO Unlimited, a business formed in mid-2020 to provide stored power and uninterrupted power sources for the global community. The problem we were presented with was the Red Cross required a portable energy device that could be put in a backpack and walked up a hill in an emergency situation to power a communications transceiver. The reason we chose to sponsor a final year project was that we had a need from a client to the New Zealand Red Cross and what we wanted to do was to short circuit the development time to get a product from concept to prototype and the university team was the ideal means to do that. In terms of funding, we were fortunate to have uh, the support of Callaghan Innovation. Callaghan were extremely generous in giving us advice and help and partnered with us towards uh, getting some of that locked up. We started off with researching supercapacitors because the idea was to use supercapacitors which charge quite fast and then slowly discharge that into a battery so it was a much more stable energy source. The problem that we came into was that a supercapacitor has a very low energy density when compared to a battery. So we had to have a large amount of supercapacitor to charge like a double A battery. But luckily we found a new technology. It was basically a hybrid between a supercapacitor and a battery. So it charges fast, but it also stores a lot more energy. So we ended up changing a lot of our project to fit around this new technology. We designed a custom charging circuit. So it took in power from mains, it converted it, and then charged the hybrid batteries, and then safely discharged them to an output. This product is a first prototype, so obviously there's a lot of improvements that can be made to it, but it's a proof of concept that using this technology will work. We were really impressed by the ability for the team to get up to speed very quickly. They all brought a different skill to, to the project team, and that meant that we had their thinking around electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, CAD design, uh, understanding project plans and uh, processes around building a solution that we could actually use and prototype. I have learned so much from this project. It's made me feel a lot more comfortable with the fact that I'm going to be in the real world next year. I'm going to have to be working in a real full-time job and this project has really allowed me to dip my toes into the water and work with clients and you know take on a big project and from start to finish figure out what has to be done. The university is the perfect partner. It has the resources, it has the lab facilities, it has the talent, it has the skills that we need from young people who we believe are going to be our future. And thank you to uh, Graham over here and Tom, I think, who helped uh, pull some of that content together. So I'm just about uh, wrapped up and I'll just finish with... Um, where are we? Oops, oh, I don't want to go there. <laughs> So, how do we get back to the slide? Where am I going? <laughs> cool, okay. right. So I just wanted to uh, finish with where to next because, uh, as I said, it's still a work in progress. We have uh, uh, quite a bit of work to, um, to do to, to refine that particular product. We've now started to work on the next one. Oh, gosh, I'm on the wrong one now. God, what am I doing? Sorry, here. Um, and we're working on um, the next iteration, if you like, of uh, um, uh, what we call an uninterrupted power supply 
um, here we go, with, uh, with a new student team. And we, we want to uh, really start testing order. And I, I, while I was sitting here uh, um, listening to other speakers, yeah, I was um, inspired by uh, Graham, particularly talking about uh, you know, putting blood products on planes and things, and, and the need to keep temperatures constant and the need to actually have power systems that can operate in that space. So we have to talk about that at some stage, Graham. But I guess it's really about market validation. We're not ready to really commercialise this until we have a working product that was totally fail-safe. We know it's a long game, not a short one, but we also have to reach high and reach, uh, reach far. We're really tapped into the super node, which I know uh, uh, Emma's going to talk about very shortly, but just to say where we fit into it, well, the health, health tech and resilient communities, uh, you know, high tech services, food fibre, virtually all of these aerospace, it, it, it really enables the energy question overlays a lot of this uh, work, and I'm really, um, you know, pleased to be able to mention Callaghan because they have been very supportive, and UC Engineering particularly so. And uh, that's our new team on the uh, right-hand side. So really, it's just to sort of say how business and university and uh, business support services like Callaghan and Co can really help uh, business like ours to to reach the, for the stars and uh, see where we go. And seek out distant horizons and cherish those you attain, which is the Maori proverb. I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to pronounce, but it is uh, my pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for uh, the opportunity. Thank you. Probably have no time for questions, I guess. But um, oh, I'm sorry. No, but, um, yeah, we round afterwards. So yeah, I'm around. Right. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Um, cool. So next up, um, we have uh, Emma Renarden from Christchurch NZ. Um, she'll talk you through the opportunities in health tech in our region. Awesome. So I'm standing between you and alcohol and food, so I'm going to keep this as brief as I possibly can, i.e. very brief. Um, so yeah, I'm Emma, and I manage our health tech and resilient communities supernode. Thank you, Michael, for the introduction. Um, I also cover our tech supernode. Um, and for anyone that isn't aware, um, Christchurch NZ is the Economic Development Agency for Christchurch. Um, so we do a whole host of things. Um, you may follow us on Facebook or Instagram and see the lovely pictures that get put up. We do city profile, uh, we do tourism, we do events. Um, we also do innovation and business growth, which is obviously a core part of our kind of services. Um, and in that innovation and business growth, we do lots of one-to-one um, -one business growth stuff. We deliver the RBP network. Um, we also do business attraction. Uh, we do investment attraction. They're kind of BAU. And then we have skills and employment, so lots of work with the university. Uh, and lastly, yay, we have our Supernode program. Um, now, Supernodes are basically regional mega clusters. Um, we've, we made up the word supernode in case you're wondering why you've never heard of them. Um, but they are essentially areas that we have um, local strength and local advantage paired with global opportunity. So these four that are up there are the ones that we identified um, in the last kind of three years. Uh, aerospace and future transport, food, fiber and agritech, high-tech services and health tech and resilient communities. It's probably worth mentioning that the kind of high-tech tech supernode kind of enables the other three. Um, it's obviously core to, to, the, other, to the others. Um, so health tech, why did we pick health tech? Well, obviously there's a lot going on in this space. You've seen that tonight. There's some awesome stuff happening in Christchurch and in the region. Um, we have a really, really strong industry. We've got some industry leaders who are doing incredible, incredible things. Um, we have a really strong supporting tertiary sector. You know, the engineering school contributes significantly um, to the talent pipeline that goes into health tech. Um, we have the CDHB, and yes, we, we know that it's being abolished, um, but it has traditionally been um, relatively innovative. It had the chief digital officer, um, or has that role, and they did establish an innovation unit, and um, they're doing a lot in the kind of innovation space, which is fantastic. 
Um, and yeah, we have a really strong supporting tech and manufacturing sector. So all of these things contribute to this sector, this industry, which has that local advantage and that local strength. And as we know, ageing population, climate change um, and just health worldwide, that is uh, the real global opportunity. So we kind of estimated that there's a potential 50 to 200 million additional economic impact. Do not ask me about that. That was in this slide from about two years ago. Um, so well, what have we been doing? Well, um, my role was brought in um, post-COVID um, because with COVID, Christchurch NZ has really prioritised socio-economic recovery. And so we really wanted to drive business growth and innovation in our super notes. Um, so since I started, I have done an industry-driven uh, structured cluster process. So clustering is an economic development uh, theory tool. Um, and we're essentially trying to look at what are the opportunities uh, for growth for our, for our industry? What are the barriers and how can we add value? Because you'll have heard from Sue and you've, you, know, you know what the people like NZTE do. We don't want to replicate any of those offerings. What we're trying to do is really look at business needs and wrap support kind of holistically around them. So we are looking at the, well, the four key things that came out of that process, which was essentially me going around talking to businesses. Um, not everyone either. We sort of picked a range of startups through to um, the really, really big ones. Um, but the four things that came out were connection and collaboration, number one. That's what they want. They want to connect. They want to network. They want to know what's going on. And they especially want to connect in with the CDHB and the wider health system. Secondly, uh, capability building. So trying to develop startups, build capability in the sorts of areas that Sue mentioned, um, capital education, um, market validation, regulatory stuff. That is a big one. Um, shared infrastructure, there's definitely um, an appetite for some sort of health tech hub, um, co-locating businesses that have maybe exited one of our incubators in the city, like ThinkLab, um, but aren't quite ready to go out and be, you know, have their own office and still want to be in those kind of cool, uh, yeah, collaborative spaces where they can learn and feed off each other. Um, and lastly, uh, the goal of a cluster traditionally is around export potential, so there's definitely appetite to collaborate offshore. Initially, um, definitely starting small with just sharing about how businesses got into market, but in the future there could be opportunities for actual collaboration. So obviously we'd be looking to work with NZTE on lots of those things. So. I've talked a little bit about it, but here are some of the key recommendations that came out of the process and some of the activity that we are going to actually be supporting or delivering or trying to deliver local government um, in the next kind of 12 months and beyond. So we really, um, the biggest thing, the biggest opportunity is improving connection with the health system and engaging with clinicians. So we're trying to kick off some sort of pilot activity to engage clinicians with the business, um, actually in the next couple of months, um, and we'll see how that goes. Obviously, clinicians are busy people doing really important work, so we're trying to work through how, how we can do that. Um, we're actually partnering with Te Papa Hora, who are the health precinct, um, to do some of this work, along with VIA Innovations, who is the innovation uh, unit at the CDHB. Um, we are building capability through sharing expertise. Um, that's a kind of offshoot of some of the kind of activity we're doing. Um, we are improving the connection and collaboration through said spaces. There's couple of proposals for health tech hubs, which I can't really talk about, but are quite exciting. Um, we, are, we have reignited something called the Canterbury Health Innovation Network, which I'll talk about, um, and we're hoping that we can improve connections between industry players, between those clinicians, uh, between the support services like Callaghan, uh, between academics potentially and people who are commercialising research, and really trying to build those connections. Um, 
we, yeah, we definitely want to make sure that we're looking at the business in the centre and wrapping the kind of support that's out there around them. Um, and I think that's kind of my role is, is sort of meeting someone and trying to connect the dots for them, uh, definitely. Uh, in relation to the uni, um, developing future-proofed talent pipelines. So how can we work with the with the unis and tertiaries to ensure that the people that are coming out of um, yeah, out of education are you know ready to go into some of these health tech businesses. Um, that's part of our BAU at um, Christchurch NZ. But how do we shape that specifically for health tech? Um, a big one, a really important one, and relates to what Sue said, is really trying to understand the investment ecosystem and attract more investment into Christchurch. Um, so we will be doing a piece of work when we. <laughs> hopefully get a really cool new person starting um, to map the health tech um, investment um, ecosystem in Christchurch and more widely to really, so we can do some targeted kind of investment attraction. Um, and I've written the same one twice, I'm not sure why that was. Um, yeah, but um, we've got some, these are some big goals. And there's quite a few um, smaller pieces of activity that we're hoping to deliver. Um, so I guess just to finish up, I really tried to keep this brief. Um, I'm really keen to engage with anyone that's in the health tech space um, and um, has any opinions about things that we should be doing. I'm happy to hear them. Um, and if you are interested or in the health tech space, we'd love you to be part of the Canterbury Health Innovation Network. Um, we had our first meetup on April 13th um, and we're having another one in June. Um, and that's a real opportunity to engage with businesses, with the support agencies, with clinicians. Um, so, yeah, keen for people to come along. I can add you to the mailing list if you pop me an email or you can sign up on the website. Um, and otherwise, yeah, happy to answer questions in there over a drink um, and happy to meet for a coffee or, yeah, pop me an email, whatever, whatever works. But hopefully that was a short and sweet what we're doing. And, yeah, really, thank you to everyone that spoke before me. It was all really interesting. And, um, yeah, definitely lots of really smart people in this room. Cool. Thank you, everyone. So thank you so much for that. Um, sounds like Emma will be a really good person to connect to afterwards. Over a drink. Um, just, oh, well, I've already done that. Um, just want to say a huge thank you to, to all of our speakers tonight. Um, join, join me once again and thank you. <laughs> so I re really appreciate it. And we do have a wee um, token of thank you, which I think you guys have well and truly earned. Um, just over there, just um, yeah, to say thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, and yeah, like, like I've said before, um, there are the contact details in here if you do want to continue the conversation with anyone who you've heard tonight. Um, yeah, let's go make some mango. <laughs>